Shouldn't have done what we did. Hello, good evening. This is Brother Smith. Uh, it's Thursday. Good evening. Hi, this is Brother Smith, First Gospel Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's Thursday evening at um, 7 p.m. In fact, it's about 7.08. I had a little bit of difficulty. Sometimes I do have a little bit of difficulty getting on Facebook for some reason. I don't know why. Sometimes it's just can take her, seems like. Anyway, I'll give it a minute here and give people time to, to log on. So I'm sure some logged on. I had I logged on and I had to get off and delete it and start all over. So uh, anyway, it's a beautiful day in, the, uh, in Arkansas. Today, about 75 degrees and just just a pretty clear day. And so we're thankful for days like this. Uh, this time of year with the, you know, it's rainy season and all. Anyway, and uh, I just want to welcome everyone and uh, tell you how much I appreciate uh, those of you that uh, tune in to our broadcast every Thursday night and um, you know, <clears throat> become a, a part of our listeners. Anyway, um, um, it's it's just good to to be serving God in this this day and that age that we're living in. We're all living in a in a um, different time time of history for those of us that uh, you know especially those of us that are older that have never, we've never lived in a pandemic like this. And even those of you that are younger certainly have the history of it to, <clears throat> to tell your, your children and their children too, and so forth. But uh, hopefully God is going to help us get past this with these uh, vaccines that it looks like that they are working and it looks like they're helping us. And, one of the things that we've learned in this pandemic this past winter is that we have almost went a whole winter without any flu, uh, flu virus. And there's no way to know why that happened, except obviously it's social distancing and the mask that has been a great um, benefit to cause that to happen. And so, you know, we might want to we might want to consider when we get colds and the flu. We might want to consider keeping our distance, keeping our hands washed, and wearing a mask. We may because there's about sixty plus thousand people every year die of the flu. This year we didn't have that, and so that part's a blessing. But it certainly doesn't remove near enough from the five hundred and maybe 60,000 in America that have died with the coronavirus. And I know when you look at that, if you look at the overall uh, population of the United States and then the number of people that actually uh, tested positive with it, but and we know it was more than that, that there's at least one and a half out of every 100 people, one and a half percent, get the get, have that have got coronavirus have died with it, and that's that's uh, that's a small number, but that's still 500, 550, 560 thousand people that didn't have to die if we hadn't had the pandemic. We may have lost again the 60 some odd thousand to the flu virus because we wouldn't have probably social distanced and and wore the mask so we we learned something out of it but uh, we certainly we certainly want it to come to an end and we're certainly praying for that and people that don't think it's very serious just haven't had it themselves and been very sick or they haven't lost a loved one that they saw them very healthy and then they saw them die of it and so you know, I, I've had several friends die of coronavirus 
in the in, since it started, and um, I'm still grieved with all of that. Anyway, that's enough. I know that you have plenty, you know, uh, said to you about coronavirus that you're not interested in continuing to hear a whole lot about it. But anyway, I'm just saying a few words, letting people get on here. Um, you know, this broadcast is it's it's not a um, it's not a worship service. It is basically a Bible study broadcast. It has been very beneficial, especially in the Zoom meetings that I'm having with the Dominican Republic because I haven't been able to go over there since a year ago, last January. Um, you know, I said, no, I've never went that long without going to the Dominican Republic. Um, and um, I'll say a little bit about the Dominican Republic. Number one, where these Zoom meetings has helped as we're having a, a Zoom meeting Bible study every Monday night. And uh, that gives those brothers over there an opportunity to hear continual teaching in body doctrine that I just can't cover that. Uh, I mean, I have over the last 20 years. It, it, it don't seem like it, but I've been going to the Dominican Republic. I went the first time in 2001 in February. So it's since February, it's been over 20 years that I've been going to the Dominican Republic. And there is a substantial work over there that God, I don't take, uh, you know, I'll take the credit for the fact that God used me and th that I obeyed God to go, um, you know, and that God helped me, you know, gave me a gift to do what he asked me to do, but really it's God's work. And I, I would have never, you know, it would have never been accomplished had not God moved on me to do it. And we have, um, just in the, uh, in La Romana, the Dominican Republic in La Romana, that's the name of a town that is about 60 miles east of Santo Domingo. Santo Domingo has well over a hundred million people in it. That's the capital. La Romana, I don't know the population of La Romana, but it's, 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 I'm sure it's over 100,000, but it's probably more like 200,000 or the whole metroplex of it. It's a pretty sizable city. Um, and it, it was known as the uh, city of the Christians. Um, and that's where God sent me to start with. And it's still our number one city, excuse me. We have... Um, let me fix my camera. I didn't realize I was a little bit out of. Let's see if that looks better. Well, maybe that'll look better to you. Anyway, um, we have Brother uh, Emilio Green in that city, Brother Elias Ciprian, and Brother uh, Jose Calderon. And then we've got a town just outside, a village outside of the city of La Romana called Benedicto. Uh, we have a work there that, that a young man is the pastor that came out of Brother Elias Ciprian's church. And um, Brother Calderon's church is in Comajon, which, but that's not over maybe, I don't know, seven, eight miles. I think it'd be less, maybe a little less than 10 miles outside of La Romana. In fact, it's La Romana spread so much that you would consider it the same town, but it is in the northwest corner of La Romana. Anyway, uh, there's probably 300 saints in those churches there in that area. I'd say very close to around 300 people. And then, uh, then we've got Brother Rudy in Igwe, and he also has the church that he has Brother Jackson over in Fuchsia. Fuchsia is about an hour away from La Romana on the eastern point. It's almost, it's just outskirts of Putacana, where everybody flies in, especially if they're going to Putacana for resorts. 
And uh, Igwe is back about 30 minutes, maybe 20, uh, 25 minutes between La Romana and, and Fuchsia. And Brother Rudy has those two works there, but Brother Jackson's a pastor over Fuchsia. And there's probably a couple hundred people there. Brother Green's also working with some people in, in Igwe. Um, then, of course, we've got the work in Pajita, which is in Inagua. That, those works are up north, uh, closer to the northern border of the Dominican Republic. And uh, then we've got Santiago, Brother Serene, uh there in Santiago. And then Brother Green's got people he's working with in Constanza, San Pedro de Marcolis. I wouldn't call any of those churches established yet, but but I will tell you, we had a Dominican-wide meeting um, a couple years ago. We didn't have anybody from the States go there outside of just me and my wife and another couple out of our church. And um, I think there was right at 500 people in that meeting. So um, there, I don't know. If you got everybody over there together, it would be close to a thousand people because a lot of those people can't travel, don't have cars, and they're spread out over these cities I'm telling you about, and they just can't. They just can't all come. For an example, Fuchsia, over 100 saints weren't able to come to that meeting. Um, if I remember all the numbers exactly correctly, but anyway, I'm just giving you a little report. God's blessed that work over there, and, and we're thankful for it, and and uh, these Zoom meetings, I would never even known to do anything like this had it not been for this pandemic. So it has taught us. I've been holding these Bible studies. Those people, uh, they connect on these Zoom meetings. They can see me. I can see them. Brother Melio Green interprets for me. And so we go through teachings, body doctrine. And, uh, you know, it's been very beneficial. In fact, I've talked to Brother Green about, um, he's got five men that really need to get solidified a little bit better and established. And I've told him, you know, find out when we can have meetings with those men and I will give them teaching, uh, you know, and, and help get them better well established. Then we also have the work in Puerto Rico, which is Brother William Ortiz. He came out of Brother Ron, Ronald Wright's assembly in Belling, Bellingham. It's not Bellingham, is it? I think it is Bellingham, Washington, uh, up in Washington State. And uh, he he's a, a Puerto Rican, and he and his wife moved back there some time ago, and Brother Wright asked me to help him, and I haven't been there yet, but he tunes into all of our Zoom meetings and Brother Emilio Green, I've sent him over there to help him and at, with the church there. And and uh, I intend to go there whenever I can. But anyway, that's just a brief report. I'm going to say something to you tonight I'm, that I've been working on and I'm just going to, I don't uh, know how, I probably won't be able to finish it, but uh, I'm going to say something to you on thoughts uh, uh, on when perfection is possible to achieve. Uh, you know, we've got teaching. we got men in the body that are teaching. You can reach perfection uh, right now. In fact, there's men that teach you can reach it anytime since the early church and that it's available to everyone now. And uh, it, some people are preaching that pretty emphatic. And I think, Right now, there needs to be a balance brought. You know, just saying that you can do it without giving scriptures on it is one thing. But we do have to be scriptural in what we're saying and what we're doing and in what we're teaching the people of God. And of course, we all know that this ministry is not together on every subject. Now, let me just tell you this. The brethren in this body and the, especially the leadership all believe in perfection, in making the bride of Jesus Christ and overcoming sin. When we say perfection, we're talking about maturity, coming to a full place of maturity. Um, 
let let let's go to uh I guess our cardinal um um chapter in the Bible um in Ephesians four, if you'll go with me there. Uh, because if I'm going to make a statement about this, I would like to at least give you scripture as to why I'm saying what I'm saying. So uh, we, we're teaching, and all of us do teach that it's going to take, you know, that we need uh, a restored church, that we are in the restoration of the New Testament church, that uh, that's necessary to have the church restored. And there's scriptures that, that helps us to understand that. And so, but I want to show you Paul's writing to the Ephesians in the early church back there in 2000 years ago. The statement he made in uh, Ephesians 4, and uh, let's start in the seventh verse where it says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So every one of us is receiving grace and it's coming, uh, it's measured out of the gift of Christ. Then he says in verse uh, eight, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Uh, you know, the way I explain that captivity captive is that, that um, we, we were at one time captivated by sin. We were captivated by the law. Uh, the, the, Jew, the Jews were. Um, but when Jesus came to them and began to reveal to them the plan of God, he captivated them with a vision of understanding what God's purpose was in him coming to the earth. And it said, and he gave gifts unto men. And now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended above all heavens that he might fill all things. Um, so he, he first went into the lower parts of the earth. There ain't nothing lower than the grave uh, and death. But uh, he first had to die, but then he resurrected. And But before he left here, he gave gifts to men. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers a five-fold ministry for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, get this, till we all come in the unity of the faith. That's something that they had back there that we don't have. Now, when I say that, it doesn't really mean that everyone back there were in absolute unity. But the, the ministry, the apostolic order that they had back there, those apostles were in unity. They, they had an understanding of the truth of God's word uh, because they had a full seven-fold life. And then verse, look, let's read 13 again. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of Man unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Those are pretty strong words concerning a perfect man to come up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That wouldn't mean that we would have the same gift he had or the same position he had, but we would have this have the same character in righteousness. We'd have to develop into a place of maturity that we had overcome the sins of the flesh. Verse 14 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, 
which is the head, even, even Christ. So uh, I just wanted to state that, but uh, as a, I guess, a foundation scripture for what I'm saying about perfection, that God gave us a fivefold ministry and apostolic order to produce, uh, how did he say that? That for the perfecting of all the saints, that would be ministers and saints. We know that God is making up his bride. He made it part of it in the early church. He's gonna make up the other uh, remainder part of the bride in the end of the Gentile world in a, in, in a restored church. That's my opinion that it'll be a restored church where this happens. So let's go some through some thoughts and some indications as to why I'm making that statement. So um, here in, um, I hope somebody, somebody get, you know, cause I'm covering up my screen. Are y'all able to, somebody, Somebody reply, comment right now and just tell me that you can see me, okay? Because I'm covering up what I can see of me, but I don't think that's hindering my camera. Could Ann, could you at least uh, comment that you can see me or somebody, Sister Layton, Brother Terry, Murrow, some, one of y'all, would you text, text, would you comment and say, I can see you? <laughs> or I can't, now I'll fix it if you can't. So nobody's, nobody's typing anything, so. Hmm. Nobody may even be able to hear me because nobody's at saying a word. Okay, Sister Cindy, I see you saying your mama is watching but I'm still trying for somebody to tell me they can see me on the broadcast because I have the camera, I have it covered up. I don't see that anybody can even hear me, much less see me. We can see you fine. Thank you, Josh. Okay, so let's go on. Okay, I want to go, I want to start out in the book of Genesis. In Genesis, uh, Genesis 2 and 23, there's an indication there that unless man reaches, um, unless man goes back into the garden, let's, let's read that in Genesis 2 and 23. I'm going to use y'all as a, uh, you know, a, uh, 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 what what am I trying to say about a? Uh, anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna practice on y'all talking about this subject because it hadn't been something I put together just like this. Um, G Genesis two, verse No, that's not the scripture I'm wanting. Maybe it's 3.23. Yes, excuse me. It is chapter 3, verse 23. And this is after Adam fell, Adam and Eve fell, disobeyed God, and God put them out of the garden. And then in verse 23, it says, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence it was taken, from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Um, somebody may try to give me the, somewhere right in here it says now, uh, yeah, let's go back up to 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now at least he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. I wrote on there, 
I see. So, yeah, other people did too. Excuse me, I'm still on. So, um, so here's a here when God puts him out of the garden, there is two cherubims. Uh, these are uh, figures of angelic wings, you know, uh, and a flaming sword that's turning in every direction to keep the way of the tree of life or the way of the garden. And now he's saying, unless man puts forth his hand and eat of the, and uh, uh, how did he say that? And eat and live forever. Take also the tree of life and eat. So he'd have to get back in the garden to eat of this tree of life. And the garden, I'll just tell you that it is a type. The garden is a type, and I'll give you more scriptures on that in a little while. But it's a type of uh, second heaven or the holy place. It, it is a type. It's not uh, the garden of Eden or paradise is certainly not um, heaven itself. Adam was there, but he got kicked out. <laughs> You know, he got put out for disobedience. Uh, he lived, another thing I want you to consider is Adam did live above sin. He had the power of God. He, he, was, he was a man that was like Christ. I mean, Christ, he was born of God. He wasn't born of a fallen nature. He was born of God. He did have a human nature and ability. He had an ability to um, to, to uh, sin or disobey, do his own will. He had that ability, but he didn't exercise that ability until he finally made the decision. And Adam told Timothy that he sinned willfully. He knew what he was doing and he knew what the penalty would be. He knew the penalty would be death. And so, but what I want, to, want you to get is, is number one, that he, it, it takes getting back in the garden to eat of the tree of life. And um, there were two cherubims put up, which I, I would say is the, those are typified by the Old and New Testament and God and Christ. God and Christ, the word of God is the Old and New Testament which the word of Jesus was called the word of God. Uh, that's, that's God's anointed word. That's God's purpose uh, for us. And we have to pass through that, those covenants to receive what God has for us to be partakers of the covenants. And then that flaming sword is the word of God that turns in every direction. It, it will reveal everything in your life so that God can correct anything that is uh, needs corrected in your life and cause you to reach maturity or perfection, an overcoming state. And so um, uh, I, I wanted to I wanted to start out there in Genesis to show that for for Adam to get back in the garden, there wasn't a fence around the garden. I mean, this is symbolic language. There was no literal cherubim, no literal sword turning in every direction. There was no, uh, he could have, if that would have been true, he just walked around it and went back in the garden. But what this typifies is the relationship that he had with God in obedience and following and doing God's will in obedience, and he decided not to do God's will and to do his own will, and therefore God removed him. His sin was far more than, uh, I would say, than most people that would be sinning today because he sinned willfully. Now, some people are in sin willfully, I know that, but they don't have the knowledge that would judge them eternally if they did sin willfully. Okay, uh, so 
let's leave that thought and go to thought number two. We've always taught that the children of Israel in the wilderness, uh, after they, after they, God brought them out of Egypt by a strong hand, and they went in wilderness journey for 40 years for God to prove them there. And afterwards, entering into Canaan, the promised land, we've always taught that that is a type of the falling away of the church of us Gentiles, that we've been in a wilderness condition. God has brought us out of the world, which is a type of Egypt, and we've been in a wilderness condition uh, following God and in, in, in God leading us to a restored church, which is Canaan. The River Jordan is what we will have to cross. River Jordan, when the children of Israel went over the river, went over River Jordan, it was overswelling its banks. And the reason for that was it was harvest time. It was in the spring of the year, which that's when the latter rains fell. And um, the snow began to melt out of the mountain and run down in all the streams. The streams ran down into Jordan. Jordan overfilled its banks. That's a picture of all of religion coming together. Babylonian situation that creates a beast system and when, when God's people, when God's ministry, priesthood, stepped into the water, Jordan rolled back. It rolled back on a heap, and they went across Jordan on dry shod ground, just like they did Egypt. Egypt's a picture of coming out of the world. Jordan is a picture of coming out as escaping the beast system and not being a part of that, being able to go across on dry shod ground. You don't even get any of it in your feet. You remember the feet is where your shoes are shod with the gospel. So the gospel of truth of Jesus Christ is not tainted by the, the muddy, lurky uh, falsehood of Jordan, which is a type of false religion all coming together. The beast system will come together in the end of this world. Again, we've always taught that the restored church is going in, is a type of going into, uh, into Jordan. And so, and of course, then after they get into Jordan, they have to kill the ites and conquer the ites in the land and conquer the land. That's a picture of overcoming the flesh and conquering the seven ites that were in Canaan. That's a, that's a picture. Seven's a type of, of fullness. And we have to fully overcome the flesh, the, the condition of the flesh and, and our will and do the, in doing the will of God. Uh, let, me, let me say something about that. You know, God's not, a, God's not a God that's interested in just, he's not a God in interest, that's interested in, in you and I just doing what he wants us to do because he wants us to do it. That's not, that's not a, a proper way of looking at God. God wants, he just wants us to be righteous. He wants you to have a will. He wants you to be an individual. That's why he made, made us with, with an iris of our eyes that nobody else has got one like it or a fingerprint of our fingers that no one's got a fingerprint that matches it. Um, you know, God made us as individuals and he wants us to be individuals. He just wants us to be righteous and he wants us to develop in uh, the talents that he has given us in our new birth and develop those talents in righteousness. And, uh, he, he wants you to have your will. He just wants it to be righteous. And that's what his will is. His will is to do things righteous. That's the will of God. God's will for you would be different than his will for me as far as, you know, what God the talents God gave me, my character, what what God wants me to become in the kingdom of heaven would be different 
You, you have different qualities. You have different talents. God wants, he, he's, he's, he's a, he has multiple uh, uh, facets in his kingdom and among his people. God's not wanting us to all to be one little puppets. He wants us to be individuals, but individuals that are righteous individuals. Uh, so I'm giving you that. Now, number two, you know, that, that type of the wilderness journey being the falling away of the church and that when we, conk, when we cross Jordan, that we're into the, a, a restored church and we still have to overcome there's still something that has to be overcome there. Uh, then uh, I think I'd like for us to go to the book of Ruth uh, next. Uh, I may get these lined out where I may add more, to get them in a different order, but right now I'm following the best order I can think in my mind. So in the book of Ruth, if, um, if you go with me to Ruth, the second chapter, Hmm. Uh, Ruth 2, and let's go to, uh, I went over this here just about a week ago, so it should be somewhat fresh in your mind that Ruth is a, a picture. It was written over 2000 years ago for the Gentiles to show that there would be a restored church and that there was to be a bride made up at that time in that restored church. So uh, the 12th verse, I wanted to mention this. Uh, let's, let's start in the 11th verse says, and Boaz answered and said unto her, it, it hath fully been showed me. Before I read that, let me just state this, that, you know, Boaz went to her and and uh, he recognized her as a, as a poor young woman that under the law of Israel had a right to glean in the field during harvest time. Again, I want you to realize it's harvest time. When there was a famine in the land, that's a picture of the falling away of the church. And Elimelech and his two sons, Malone and Kilion, uh, they moved to Moab. Those two boys married Moabitish women, Ruth and Orpah. And uh, then Elimelech died and finally the boys died. And uh, Ruth she later heard that God had visited the land of Israel, and so she wanted to go back to Israel. He visited it because, from the famine. In other words, God gave them rain. They were having a harvest. She wanted to go back. Well, Ruth, Orpah, didn't get what Ruth got from, from Elimelech and the two brothers. That, that She didn't get, it wasn't imparted to her. Somehow she didn't get the vision. But Ruth did, in so much she was willing to leave everything to get what they had. And so when she came there, no doubt, Naomi explained to her the law in Israel that if you were a poor person, you didn't have any land, you could go glean. Uh, it was a law that the, those harvesting, uh, their fields could not harvest the corners. They had to leave the corners for the poor people and allow them to come in and glean and get provender for themselves in that way. And she found that out. So she went and she landed on the field of Boaz. Of course, you know the story. He happened to be one of her uh, uh, near kinsmen. And uh, she finally wound up marrying him and becoming, which is a picture, Boaz is a picture of Christ She's a picture of the Gentile church and, and it's a picture of the bride being made up with those that fulfill the type of Ruth. So here he tells her in 11, it, uh, she asked him, why are you being so kind to me? Why have I found grace in your eyes? 
you know, why are you telling me that I can glean, uh, that I can drink from your water pots, you charge your young men not to touch me. And, and she didn't know this, but he even went to his reapers and told them to let her glean among the sheaths and don't correct her and push off a little extra off the cart far. Just a picture when you come into the body of Christ, if God sees you've got the right spirit together, what God's given in the body of Christ, he'll give you not only the right to glean, he'll let you eat among his maidens. He'll let you be a part. He'll let you drink from the water pots. Just drink of the spirit of God anytime you're thirsty for it. It's available to you. Uh, he's put a charge on his ministry not to hurt you, not to, uh, you know, I know there's been people hurt, but God, God's put a charge and God won't let that go too far. Uh, part of that's the pains of going through reformation and men of God learning wisdom of how to treat God's people like he wants them to be treated. But she asked him, why have you shown me this grace? Verse 11 says, Boaz answered and said unto her, it has fully been shown me all that thou hast done unto thy mother and law since the death of thine husband and how thou hast left thy father and mother and land of thy nativity and art come unto a people that thou knowest not heretofore. In other words, he's saying, I, it's, I know, I know about you. You've been told, I know that you left everything to be a part of Israel. It's a type of people among the Gentiles that gets a vision of the body of Christ and the restoration of the church that <clears throat> we leave in everything. We've left everything in our lives, uh, families. Jesus said that as many as, as leave houses and lands, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, for my sake, will I give a hundredfold in this life as well as uh, life everlasting in the world to come. So <clears throat> you're, when you get this vision, you, you'll give up everything to be a part of what God's doing. And that's what Ruth got. And then let's look what he says in verse 12. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. I taught on full rewards. I believe last Sunday in Bible study, I taught on rewards and a, a full reward is to come to a place of fullness the fullness of, of Christ that I read you about and to reach a place of maturity and perfection. <clears throat> um, so and I just wanted to remind you, this pitch, this story is a type and it shows that in the Gentile world, <clears throat> there will be a restoration of the church. God is visiting his land and, um, there is, a, there is a harvest coming for the Gentiles. <clears throat> and if we all have the spirit that Ruth had, that uh, Christ will, he will serve us with the type of being our, uh, our near kinsman. And, and the, the type was that if your husband died, then the next of kin would marry you and raise up children uh, from you. And, and so and that's what happened to Ruth. He said, there's a nearer kinsman than I am. So Ruth, you have to wait and see if that near kinsman wants to, wants the, to take the right of near kinsman. Well, that near kinsman was the law. And the law of God, that near kinsman told Boaz, he said, I can't marry her. I'll lose my inheritance if I do. And the type of that near kinsman was the law, the law of God. If the law of God can't find anything in you, you overcome sin. You reach perfection. 
the law of God ceases to exist. It would lose its inheritance. So it could not join up with something righteous because there, there is no, where there's no sin, there's no law. And so that's just a type there. But, it, but what I'm trying to show you is, is that in this restored church, after this famine, during this time of harvest, there was a Gentile church that came into this restored church and made the bride of Jesus Christ. That's what this little story shows. So then I know I'm not going to get through tonight, but I will give you some, I'll give you some scriptures you can look at. Uh, the next would be Joel, the second chapter of Joel. If you'll go there with me. I know I wasted a little bit of time getting started here tonight, but I was trying to give people time to uh, to get on. I was a little bit late getting on myself, so we may go a little bit over time since I didn't start till about 7.08. Uh, the second chapter of Joel, and uh, let's see, I think in the, I want to read the second and third verse to you. These are verses that the local church of here has heard me get over, but I've never put them together right here to show you scriptures and types as to why I'm looking at a restored church. Now, let me maybe I should stop right here and say this, that of course I believe in a resurrection uh, like, like the resurrection of Matthew 27, 52, uh, in the restored church, I think there's a resurrection of the just, that those that died just during the wilderness, during the dark ages, during the time of reformation, even right now, that if they're serving God and they're upright, they're faithful, they're just, they're blessed of God, they're saints, they're holy, they're wise, I think all of those are synonyms that shows that you're just person and you're worthy to come up in a resurrection for the purpose of making the bride. I think there's scriptures for that. Of course I do. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even consider that if I didn't think that there was enough scripture to, to substantiate it. And therefore, I'm not saying you can't make the bride. I'm saying everyone that has a vision to overcome sin. The price for eternal life is overcoming sin. It's overcoming the Adamic nature. It's overcoming your will. It's doing the will of God in righteousness of what God wants out of you. And therefore, it's available to you. I'm not telling anybody it's not available. It is available. I'm just saying it's available in the resurrection of the just that takes place in the restored church. Um, everything I see in the resurrection in Matthew, in Revelations 20 is the resurrection of the unjust. So I don't put those two resurrections together. Um, anyway, so, uh, but, but I think I'm saying the same thing, men that are saying, that you, you need to serve God diligently. You need to strive lawfully to make the bride of Jesus Christ. I'm saying the same thing. I'm just saying, I've been in this over 40 years. I've This body's over 100 years old. I've yet to meet anyone that, that and I'm not, I'm not their judge, but I haven't met anyone that I feel that I've known, and I've known some great men and been close to some great men but those men wouldn't even claim that they made the bride. And so, uh, you know, Peter knew. He said, God has showed me that I must shortly put off this tabernacle. The apostle Paul said, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Those men, they knew that, that they had made it. Well, I think there's quite a bit left in a restored church we don't even have an apostolic ministry, apostolic order right now. I certainly believe we're going to need that. Um, and the power of God and all the gifts of the Spirit in operation. 
uh, the fruit, uh, you know, of, of those spirits, the, the, the seeing of the working and manifestation of God that bears witness with us that God's got men, that whatsoever they bind on earth is bound in heaven, whatsoever they loose on earth, whoever sins they remit is remitted, who they retain is retained. Those are things that, that, that the apostles in that early church had. Um, so here, uh, let me, I want to read this in Joel because it alludes back to my first a statement about in Genesis about eating of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Let's read verse 2, Joel 2, verse 2. A day of darkness, of gloominess, a day of clouds, thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. This is talking about the early church. Remember in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, Peter got up and he said this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. This is Joel's prophesying. He, he, as a matter of fact, in the end of this chapter is where he said he'd pour out his blood, uh, spirit on all flesh. So he's talking about the early church here. A great people and a strong. They have not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. What I want you to get out of that is, is that that early church is this great people and strong people. There's never been a people like this people when that talking about those people in the early church, because there had never been a people that was born of God. They were all born of Adam prior to this. There was no one that was born of God's spirit, God's nature, until the day of Pentecost when that started, the new covenant people, the body of Jesus Christ, and uh, there was never a people that was that could become righteous and inherit eternal life like these people. It said, and neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. I want you to consider that what that's saying is, is it would be a long time, many generations, in fact, 2,000 years before the Gentiles, before there would be a people like this in the restored church. So um, my phone, Google just got on and says she didn't understand what I was saying. <laughs> These phones are something. All right, verse three, a fire devours before them, that's judgment, and behind them a flame burneth, that's judgment. In other words, every, this church headed into judgment, they had to be judged themselves. Judgment first must begin at the house of God, Peter said, and behind them, see, they left, that judgment was behind them, a flame burned, and the land is as the Garden of Eden before them. They were headed back through those two cherubims, past that flaming sword that turned in every direction. They was going back in the garden, which God said concerning Adam, now least man put forth his hand and eat of the tree of life and live. That's talking about eternal life. And behind them is a desolate wilderness. That's the falling away of the church and nothing shall escape them. Nothing would escape the judgment that God not only put them through, but used them to judge that Jewish world with. And then I want to add also, let's go down to the 16th verse. Let's start in 15. It says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a, call a solemn assembly. See, that's a serious assembly. That's a, this, this is really where the, you know, rubber beats the road, so to speak. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. See, that, that when the early church came, it was a time of harvest. It was a time that there was a people that could go back into the garden condition 
and live above sin. Remember, when Adam was in the garden, he he had to live above sin. He had enough power and enough knowledge of God to live above sin, yet he still wasn't perfect. He still hadn't matured yet. He couldn't have fell if he had it, but he was in a condition where he had the power and he could have finished his course just like Jesus did. Jesus lived in that garden condition. Uh, you know, he was he called the second man Adam. Uh, Paul called him in 1 Corinthians 15. Now go down to verse 20, uh, verse 23. We'll read 23 through 25. But glad, uh, be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he's given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. What that means is that, see, Israel had two calendars. They had a, they had a um, spiritual calendar, which started at Passover. That was their first month of their spiritual calendar, which started on the day of Pente uh, the Passover. Jesus died on the Passover. He sent the Holy Ghost back at uh, Pentecost 50 days later. That started the harvest time in the early church, which went all the way to the end in October when the harvest, the natural harvest is the picture, all that harvest was finished. And during that 45 year period of time, God harvested that world and made up a portion of his bride as a spiritual harvest. Verse 24 says, oh, in the it said in the first month. So in the first month of, of Abib, uh, uh, when the Passover was, that started a new year, the first month of a new year. That was their spiritual month. But in what would be equivalent to our October, approximately, maybe the end of September or in October, would be the first month of their agricultural year when the early rains fell. That's when they planted barley and wheat seed that wouldn't come up until the latter rain uh, because the Passover started at the barley harvest. So uh, it was in the first month of each one of those calendars that God, God gave rain when that seed was planted, it wasn't a, a famine. If it had been a famine, there wouldn't have been there wouldn't have been a good harvest. But God gave good rains in the fall, or in the early rains, and even down through the winter that protected that harvest of barley and and wheat. And then, of course, in the spring when the latter rains fell, that produced a harvest of the full head of wheat the full corn, uh, it, it, it produced uh, uh, the, the uh, in other words, it finished the harvest. It was brought to harvest. None of that seed, not, no wheat or barley will ever come to a full harvest uh, age during the winter or in the fall or even in early, you know, the sun's too far. That's a picture. The we are too far from God during the early years, during the dark ages. We're too far from God and understanding God's word, knowing how to be led of God and, and grow and mature is too far from God. But now, see, the picture is during harvest time, the sun's coming close. We're living right now in the springtime. The sun's coming closer to the earth, or really, you should say, the earth's getting closer to the sun in our orbits. And in that seasonal time, it's a season in the natural right now uh, that there's enough warmth that's going to bring forth harvest in the world. And spiritually, when it's time for the church to be restored, that is harvest time. And we have scriptures to show now, verse 25 said, well, let me read verse 24. And the floors shall be full of wheat and the fats will overflow with wine and oil. That's talking about the grape harvest and the olive tree harvest. That's the spirit of God and the word of God, what that typifies in 
this rest in this early church that's what happened but it's also uh, uh, you can use this in application for the restored church when it's restored it's going to accomplish the same thing that's why i say this people that will show up many generations later is alluded to here in this chapter and verse 25 said now restore unto you the years the locusts have eaten the canker worm the caterpillar and the palmer worm those those worms the locust represents babylon the canker worm uh, the babylon that that was a one of the dragon heads that ruled over israel then the canker worm was made of persia caterpillar caterpillar was uh, greece and then the palmer worm is rome god restored what was taken away by those uh, uh, those worms was restored uh, in the early church, and it'll be restored also down here. Remember, Rome will be the eighth head. We still have the workings of these worms and the, their destruction in the world that the Gentile world will have to overcome. So I just wanted to give you that type, and then... You know, I could show you, and go with me right quick. I realize that I'm running out of time, but in John, uh, the, I believe it's in the fourth chapter. Is that where it's at? Where Jesus, um, you know, well, first I'll just tell you in Luke 2, he said that he told his disciples the, har the, truth is, the harvest truly is right, but the laborers are few, and he told them to pray for laborers. Then in John 4.35, that's where he said, um, you know, he, he, he said that don't say there's four months to harvest, for he said the fields were white and ready to harvest. Of course, it was four months before harvest, and the fields were green as gourd. But he was, he was seeing something in the spirit that God was getting ready, that the harvest was ready for the end of the gen or for the Gentile world, he knew it was soon. He was coming back on the day of Pentecost, and the harvest would begin, and the wheel, the fields were white and ready for that to happen. In the time that he spoke that, then I would say uh, we won't go to all these scriptures, but the eleventh chapter of the book of Revelations, the eleventh chapter, the. Uh, of the book of Revelations. There's more, a lot more scriptures I would give you, but I'll give you some main ones here. That 11th chapter shows it starts off telling John to measure the temple and everything that's in it. Uh, but the outer court leave out, that's for the Gentiles to trot underfoot for, for uh, 42 months. That's a 1200, prophetically, it's a 1260 year period of time that Catholicism ruled the Gentile world, and the church had fell away. That's why there wasn't nothing left but the outer court. So either that ha what has to happen in the restoration is the holy place and the holy of holies has got to be brought back into condition or for the Gentile church. All we've been working on is in the outer court. We haven't yet went into the holy place. We don't have a sevenfold light that's in the holy place, the candlestick, or the 12 loaves of unleavened bread that the 12 apostles put forth. We realize that that's why we've got a problem with understanding all of our doctrine is not in unity yet. And so I always tell the saints here in Little Rock, you know, everything I'm teaching you, I'm teaching it to the best of my knowledge. And I'm giving you why, scriptural, of how I see these things. And, but I tell them, but uh, be flexible enough that if God shows us where we need to make some adjustment, that we're willing to make it. Don't be so hard headed that we can't change. If God, if somebody can explain something and give us better understanding of scripture than what I'm doing, then I would be a fool not to accept it. And, you know, so I'm, I want the truth. I want the truth of the word of God. 
I sure do. And um, so I'm just trying to give you some scriptures. Okay, but in the 11th chapter, then it shows those two witnesses, which is the Old and New Testament, lay dead in the streets for this three and a half years, which is 42 months, represents the 1260 years. Um, so during the dark ages of the Gentile age, uh, there was no life in the word of God in, in the church system back there. That's not, that doesn't mean that there's not people that had faith in all that they did know, but there wasn't life being produced out of the church and people were in gross confusion. But just like during the law, they served God with all they knew. And I think there were people that certainly died just, that they were faithful in all that they knew. Uh, and, and God couldn't give them any more than what he gave them. Um, it, it just wasn't available to everybody back there. Um, but um, then uh, in that 11th chapter, I would say, uh, let me, where... Uh, in the 11th verse, I'll read it. said, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into those two witnesses and they stood up on their feet. Fear, great fear fell on them. And then they heard a voice from heaven saying, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. All right. And uh, so then the seventh trumpet blows. The, the last prophetical hour takes place. I don't have time to explain the the seven trumpets. I know that I know there's several different uh, ways of looking at them, but I I uh, I have certainly reason why I'm looking at them the way I am. But the bottom line is here in the 18th verse. It said the nations were angry. Thy wrath is come. The time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou should give reward to your servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, both great and great, small and great, and destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. Verse 19. See, it wasn't opened, but now it's opened in the restored church. There's a way been opened up uh, to get back into the Garden of Eden, to finish your course, to make the bride of Christ, and that's through that resurrection there. Um, then I'll just finish this with Revelations, the 14th chapter. I'm just, I wanted to give you scriptures uh, to show uh, why I'm seeing in all of these scriptures and all these types that it's in a restored church where the bride is made up. It was in the divine order. That early church had a sevenfold light. They had it all. We need that in restoration to have what they had and to be able to accomplish what they accomplished. We don't need a restored church if you can make the bride at any time. Some people say, oh yeah, we do. We need it to judge the world. Just remember judgment first must begin at the house of God. You're not going to judge the world if you can't judge yourself. If you can't go through judgment yourself unto perfection and fullness of Christ in your life, you're not going to judge this world. That church back there was able to judge that world because of the righteousness of God that was working in those people. And I'm not saying we're not righteous. We are in a measure, but there's still we're still counted righteous because of the work on the cross that Christ did and he's still working on us to truly make us righteous and not have to count us righteous by the work that Christ uh, did for us to be our mediator until he, his finished work takes place in us. Okay, so here in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelations, I want to read the 13th verse, I want mainly the 14th verse, but I want to read this 13th verse because to me it's significant. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, 
Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Why would there be a time that you could be blessed, more blessed to die in the Lord from that point forward, if it's not talking about from the restoration of the church, from that point forward, that you can enter into your rest, rest from your labors, do the will of God, enter into the Sabbath. Um, and then uh, verse 14 says, and I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one set like unto the son of man having on his head a golden crown in his hand, a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sharp sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud, that's a restored church, thrust in his sickle, that's the word of God, that was in his hand, which is his ministry, on the earth and the earth was reaped. So God did a great work there in reaping that earth, making up his bride. And of course, uh, they would rule and reign with him down through the thousand years. I have more scriptures I, I, I wanted to, you know, maybe go into, but I'm just using y'all, I guess, tonight as a sounding board just to work out some of my thoughts in my mind and give you, uh, you know, I'm just going to tell you, I don't like, I don't like being unpopular with brethren that don't agree with me or don't see the scriptures the way I do. I like being, I, I like being liked. Uh, but, you know, we are lawyers, all of us ministry in the word of God. And God holds it to us. I think God has charged me to hold up this position uh, until God helps us to come into unity. See, if, if we all just accepted what someone said, but we didn't believe it, that would be the way Babylon does things. That would just be, you know, we don't ask any questions. We don't question anything. But I, I appreciate, I even appreciate the men of God that have positions different than I am because it makes me search over and over every facet and the scriptures of why I have position on what I position on. I am a teacher of the word of God. I think I have more gift than just a teacher, but I'm a pastor for one. But um, um, I... Uh, uh, this one of the charges I feel like God's gave me and I have to give you uh, at least if I've got it wrong, I need someone to help me know where I'm wrong. Give me some help. So I love all of you. God bless your hearts. Thank you for, uh, for staying with me tonight till I kind of shared my heart, got some of those things off of my chest, so to speak. And uh, let's see who else on here before we go home. I do want to say um, my son, Brother Michael Smith, and his wife, Cindy, she's my daughter too. And, but her mama, Sister Angie Elder, is here. Uh, she's having quite a few health conditions. Please pray for her. And uh, she's staying with Michael and Cindy at this time. And uh, Cindy loves her mama. Of course, we all love her. And we're praying for you, Sister Elder. So just keep your head up, keep looking to the Lord, and I know God will help you. Um, it's good to have you, Sister Betty Layton, uh, on with us tonight. Brother uh, Fidel from Guatemala, uh, good to have y'all. Brother Brother Clyde Quick, I appreciate Brother Quick. Sister Tansy, yes, I see you're on here too. Thank you for telling me you can see me on the whole screen. Well, I was putting up scriptures and things on top of that, and I, I thought, I don't think I'm hurting this, but maybe I ought to know. Brother brother Ronald Wright out in in, uh, in Washington, God bless your heart, Brother Wright. Good to have you. Brother Miru, 
I don't know if I'm saying that even right, Brother Terry. You and Sister Angela, God bless your hearts. Sister Judy Kane, Sister Anthea Calderon, God bless your heart. And Sister Ruth Calderon from the Dominican Republic. Um, Brother Daniel Newman, God bless your heart. <laughs> Can a person still get the old Little Rock cassette of the songs from the 80s? I believe so, Brother Daniel. Let me see what I can do to help you with that. I think it's possible. Brother Elias Ciprian, Pastor Ciprian from the Dominicans. Good to have him. Um, several others on here. I know I can't mention everyone, but God bless your heart. Uh, all of you for coming. Pray for me. Remember, I always say, I'll pray for you. But please pray for me. Um, I love the Lord and I love God's people and I love the word of God. God bless your hearts. Those of you local, I'll see you Sunday morning. By the way, we're having regular breakfast Sunday morning at 9.30. Now, that's a little bit of encouragement to want to come to Bible study, but the main encouragement ought to be for the word of God. So I'll see all you saints in Little Rock Sunday morning. You know, um, and uh, until then, God bless your hearts. Keep your head up. Keep looking to the hills from which cometh your help. Your help comes from the Lord.